Hello, this is Matt Crump, and we are back with Psych 2530, What is Cognition? This is the first lecture for learning module number one. We're doing a very general, broad overview of cognition in this module. Let's get started. The reading for this learning module is from chapter one in the textbook. Here's the link. Check it out. Read the chapter. It's about 30 minutes long. These slides will support the content in that chapter. It's very similar, but also a little bit different to mix things up a little bit. So here's the roadmap. We're going to talk about questions of cognition in general, overview some of the methods that cognitive psychologists use, some findings, explanations, applications, and implications. This is a lot of territory to cover. We're going to do it in some general ways, talking about the field as a whole and using a concrete example. So in some specific ways, we'll use a concrete example from the reading literature to show how these various aspects of cognition are addressed when you're trying to answer one specific question. All right, I wanna use a museum metaphor for this entire course. We've got a picture of the Metropolitan Museum of Art here. If you've ever been there, it's very large. There's too many rooms in this thing to see in one day. There's way too many artifacts. So cognition is like this museum. It's got a lot of diversity of things and people and places and ideas and approaches. There's too much in cognition and in a museum to see in one day, too much to see in one course. So we have to adopt some strategies to get through the content, to provide an overview, get some breadth, and also to dive into some of the details and get some depth. So just like in a museum, you might get a tour guide to navigate you through this monstrosity. I'll try to be your tour guide of cognition. We're gonna go into different rooms, talk about the artifacts of cognition, uh, talk about all sorts of different things. Today, one of those artifacts we'll be focusing on as a case example is from the reading literature. We'll get into that shortly. So one of the broad umbrellas that we'll be talking about throughout the course are the different kinds of questions that researchers ask about cognition. We, we should also try to start off with a definition. What is cognition? Question mark. Then we can get into the kinds of questions that researcher asking uh, researchers are asking and answering about cognition. We'll use the entire course to try to define cognition. Here's an early definition from Ulrich Neisser, a cognitive psychologist who wrote a textbook called Cognitive Psychology in 1967. So he defined cognition as all of the processes by which the sensory input is transformed, reduced, elaborated, stored, recovered, and used. This definition is a kind of information processing definition of cognition. We'll talk about the information processing tradition later on in the course. This definition is still current and we will expand on it in the course. There's missing parts. Ulrich Neisser, here's another quote. Uh, he also said, if X is an interesting or socially important aspect of memory cognition, then psychologists have hardly ever studied X. So this is a critique of cognition. In many ways, the field of cognition is an unfulfilled promise. Lots of work has been done, but there are many more interesting questions to ask. So we should also think about the discipline as uh, avenues to pursue questions to ask in the future. Let's jump in, take a look at some research questions. So research questions are typically about how a particular cognitive ability works. Here's some examples. How do you control your body movements? I'm doing this right now, moving my fingers. I'm making facial expressions. How is it that I'm able to do that? How do you pay attention to different kinds of things in the environment? Uh, how do you focus on something? How do you ignore things? How is it that you can forget what you were doing right in the middle of doing something? That happens to me sometimes. 
Is it possible to train your brain to get better at different cognitive abilities? How about things like language? How do you learn to read? How do you know the meaning of words? And how can you learn to read faster? This is just a very short list of possible research questions. There's many more. We're going to focus on this one question here for the rest of this lecture in order to illustrate some of the other features of the cognitive discipline in general. Before we do that, I want to make you aware that, you know, like in the museum, there's lots of different rooms. There's lots of different research domains in cognition where people ask more specialized questions. So here's a short list. We've got learning, memory, attention, perception, reasoning, categorization, concept formation, judgment, decision-making, language, semantic knowledge, skill acquisition, music perception, motor control, cognitive control, creativity, emotion, object recognition, pattern recognition, implicit learning, working memory, individual differences, consciousness, whew, and, and there's more. And there's lots more that won't be covered in this textbook. But it's worth knowing that the domains exist and you can, if you do a literature review, go learn about what has been studied and what has been identified or known or hypothesized to exist in all those different domains. So let's say you're interested in jumping into one of those aspects of cognition. How would you go about answering research questions? What do cognitive researchers do to figure out how those various abilities work? This gets us into methods. Methods of all different shapes and sizes are used across cognition to answer the different questions of cognition. Just like there's lots of different questions, lots of different approaches to answering them. One commonality across the methods is the use of the research cycle. And here's a little picture here. It's a circular self-reinforcing cycle where researchers start with a question or observation they do some background research on that topic area to figure out what has been learned about that topic before. And based on that learning episode, the researcher might generate a new hypothesis and then test that hypothesis with an experiment. The experiment will produce results that can be analyzed and then the findings can be reported to the scientific community. These new findings could raise new questions, and the cycle continues. So we're gonna take a look at the research cycle many times throughout this course, and we're gonna do it in this lecture by looking at an example from the reading literature. So let's do that. Let's start with an observation or a question. How can a person read faster? Are there tricks? How about speed reading? Is that a thing? Can speed reading work? Here we've got a little gift from the movie Short Circuit where this robot's reading a book very quickly. Is it possible for you to learn to read this quickly? Uh, unfortunately, the answer is probably no, but let's take a look at what the research has shown on these kinds of issues. So we've begun with a research topic area. That is reading. How does it work? How does speed reading work? In the background research stage, what you should do as a researcher is try to figure out what other research has already been done on the topic. So one thing you could do is search for papers using Google Scholar. You could use the Brooklyn College Library search tool. Uh, there's other search engines you could use. You'll use these things to find existing journal articles published in um, scientific journals read the papers, learn what they say. You might even use a PDF manager. We'll talk about a program later on in this course called Zotero that will help you manage this type of stuff if you're doing um, a literature review. All right, let's do a little quick search ourselves. We're gonna head over to Google Scholar and we're gonna search how to read faster. Uh, sorry, how to read faster. Let's see what happens. I'm gonna copy that, head over to Google Scholar, pop that in the toolbar and press enter. What we're seeing here is a list of different articles that have been returned. We could read this one about reading faster. 
We could read this one. Read faster, read better. Results of a high-performance reading course at Mississippi State University. We could read this paper. There's many papers. As you can see, there's uh, about 2.43 million results returned. That is a lot of information. Too much information for anybody to try to understand, read on their own. This raises an important question. It's a skill we'll try to find places to develop at some point over the semester. How do you find the good stuff? One way is to try out different search terms that might be relevant to more specific questions you're interested in. So how about this? Let's search, uh, does speed reading work? Maybe you wanna know about that. We can cross our fingers and hope that we get a really great paper to read. Now I've done this search before and it turns out the first one that comes up, so much to read, so little time. Let's click the PDF here. This is a PDF of a, a review paper published in Psychological Science in the Public Interest. And it is a fantastic paper. It's by several authors who are experts on reading. And if you read this whole thing, it's pretty long. It's gonna bring you up to speed right away on lots of knowledge that the reading researchers have produced over many years. You could read all of that stuff and then possibly come up with new ideas about how to improve reading. So let's say you did that. You get up to speed, you've done your literature review. The next thing you might wanna do as a researcher is come up with this new hypothesis. Let's take a look at that. So how would you come up with a testable hypothesis uh, based on your literature review? This is something uh, that's an important part of the research cycle. And uh, we will be going through these various research cycles in many other examples throughout the course. So in many other cases in cognition, like in this example, researchers start with a some kind of prior observation about the domain in question. Our domain in our example is reading. Here's a prior observation that you could have based on reading that review. This is a known fact about the visual system. So when you're reading and you're looking at words, when you stare at the middle of a word, that's where you're fixating, um, because you're using your fovea to fixate on that word, you will have the highest amount of visual acuity. And so what that means is if you're staring at this sentence, your, oh, looks like my video stream has messed up here. All right, I think my video stream is back to normal. So I was doing something like this. If you're looking at this sentence, Perceptually, the word that you're looking at in the middle will have the highest acuity. It will be the clearest to you. When you start looking at, or sorry, when if you're looking at the word fox in this example, your peripheral vision will be used to look at the letters beside on the outside. And your peripheral vision has worse acuity. So that means when you're looking at any given word in a sentence, the word you're looking at is clear and the, word in your the words in your peripheral vision are blurry. How could we use this prior observation to generate a testable hypothesis about reading? Here's an example. So we know it's easy to see words you're looking at, but harder to see the other words in the sentence because peripheral vision is blurry. If I put my thinking cap on, I could wonder, well, maybe reading speed depends on visual acuity of peripheral vision. Could it be that reading speed would be faster or improved if people could see the words in the periphery more clearly? For example, if we could somehow make your peripheral vision uh, see the words that are blurry as more clear, would it be easier for you to read the sentence? In order to find out, 
we would need to use an experiment or some kind of research method. So the purpose of an experiment would be to create a controlled situation to test your hypothesis. We'll talk about experiments as having three important components. An independent variable, this is some manipulation that has at least two conditions where you try to change something about the situation. You're gonna need a dependent variable. This is a measurement that you're taking. For example, you could be measuring how fast people read under different conditions. And then in general, your experiment will have an empirical question. The question is, did your manipulation cause any differences in your measurement? So let's take a look how this might play out in a reading example. We have to think about what kind of manipulation could possibly improve peripheral vision. How would you make the words and letters out in the periphery more clear? We could have a control condition. Maybe people read words and letters under normal viewing conditions here, and we measure how fast they can read. In the experimental condition, we need to change something. We're gonna to try to improve peripheral vision. And then we will also measure reading ability over here, see if something changes. Let's take a look at an example from the literature where some researchers tried to do exactly this. So they had a control condition where participants read a sentence. For example, here's a sentence. He could never get rid of the image from his mind. In the paraphobial magnification condition, this was a really cool experimental technique to try to make words out on the periphery easier to read. What they did was they used an eye tracker so they could follow along where a person was looking and based on where they were looking, they could make the computer display words out on the edges as larger. So you could see here, if a person was looking at this word, the computer display would display these letters larger and larger and larger and larger. And if you make the letters larger on the outside, your peripheral vision will see those letters more clearly. So the paraphobial magnification technique is one way to help your peripheral vision see the words and letters more clearly. Now, what happened? That's a good, good question. Let's summarize the situation. We've got a control condition with regular reading and a paraphobial magnification condition with this funny magnified in the periphery reading. We're gonna measure reading ability in both situations. We're gonna ask the empirical question, will this manipulation change anything about reading performance compared to the control condition? But this brings up another important question. How do we measure reading ability? There's lots of ways we could do this. For example, how many words per minute someone reads? We could give someone a memory test and ask them to remember the words they read. Or we could give a comprehension test to figure out if they understood what they were reading. We could try to figure out how many letters they can perceptually view at a time. Maybe that would be something to measure. We'll learn in this example and in others in the course that our measures of cognitive performance aren't always perfect. A person could read really fast with a high number of words per minute, but comprehend very little of what they read. So would words per minute be a good measure of reading ability? A person could pass a comprehension test even if they didn't read something, for example, they might be able to pass the test because the questions weren't very good or because they could use their general knowledge that they already had in order to pass the comprehension test. So it's not necessarily clear if comprehension tests is measuring the reading ability. Because of these kinds of issues, researchers do use a modicum of measurement creativity. They try to create um, and be clever about finding measures that will help them answer the questions they're interested in asking. We'll see lots of examples of this in the course. All right, let's get back to the reading experiment here. And 
as we do that, we're moving into another general section about our overview. That is, when researchers ask questions, they come up with some methods to ask those questions, and those methods will produce findings. We'll be looking at a lot of those in the course. Let's look at what those researchers found with their parafovial magnification technique. So these are also known as experimental results or findings. And generally, when we refer to findings, we'll be referring to what happened to the measurement under the different levels or conditions of the manipulation. So let's take, take a look. Here are the results from their experiment. I'll tell you the results right now. Uh, they measured average sentence reading time and they found what are known as null results, no differences. The conclusion was the parafovial magnification manipulation did not change reading time. Let's take a look at the data. It's right here in this table. They're presenting average sentence reading time. There's two major columns. The normal column refers to normal text. And you can see these numbers are all around two, which means that people took about two seconds to read their sentences. PM stands for parafovial magnification. And you can see that most of these numbers are about two also. So it took about two seconds to read those sentences when the words on the outside were made bigger. As you can see, it's twos everywhere. So this interesting manipulation didn't really make reading speed so much faster. Now an important step after data has been collected and analyzed is to make some kind of inference from the result back to those original hypotheses that you might have had. So for example, an inference these authors might have made is making peripheral words bigger does not improve reading speed. Once you've made an inference, you can have all sorts of additional questions. Why didn't this work? Was there some kind of mistake? Maybe the words needed to be even bigger. They weren't big enough for it to have an impact on peripheral vision. Maybe it will never work, no matter how big you make those words. And if that's the case, what, what does that say about how reading works? We can kind of draw back on our question and return to a broader question. How does reading work in general? These are big questions that require explanations. And what does a cognitive explanation look like? These are nuanced questions. We won't get into this so much in the topic of reading today. We're gonna to address these kinds of issues throughout the course when we look at specific phenomena. There's lots of different approaches by cognitive researchers to explanation. And there are different levels of explanation. One example of different levels is from vision scientist David Marr, who talks about computational, representational, and implementational or hardware levels of analysis. For example, at the computational level, um, we are referring to the goal of a process. So your question might be, with reading as an example, what are the goals of a reading process? And the kind of explanation you're looking for might be, well, reading processes. Well, let's see, that's one way for a person to receive semantic information. If they knew how to write, they could create text and show it to another person and use it for communication. So this kind of explanation refers to the goal of a cognitive ability. At the representational level, we might be referring to the um, way that the ability works. So for example, what are the inputs to the process? What transformations modify those inputs? 
What are the outputs of the process? In the context of a reading question, you might ask, okay, what kind of perceptual information are people receiving for reading? How is this perceptual information used, transformed in the brain? How is it turned into semantic information? At the hardware level, we are starting to ask questions about how these representations and algorithms are physically instantiated. For example, here we might be asking, what are the brain mechanisms of reading and how do they work? So there's these, at least these three different kinds of levels of explanation and analysis. When we think about explaining any cognitive ability, like reading, um, it's worth backing up and wondering, well, what would I want an explanation to be? What would an explanation of reading, for example, look like? And what would I want these explanation to be able to do? What counts as an explanation? Here's a few common answers to these questions. A theory or explanation of something like reading or any other cognitive ability should be able to, one, account for existing experimental findings in the literature. They should be able to predict the results of new experiments so they can be used to generate predictions and in turn inspire potentially new lines of research. It could also be helpful if your explanation was uh, clear enough or your theory was uh, coherent enough to generate applications that could be useful for people. And this gets us into another general theme we'll be talking about over the semester, that is applications of cognitive research for society. When we think about applied cognition, we will see that the research cycle does sometimes produce useful things that can be used. We will see examples of successes and some examples of failure throughout the course. When it comes to reading, ideally research on that process should be able to help children learn to read. It should be able to help people with dyslexia and it may even help uh, people learn to read faster even once they've achieved a high level of reading skill. At the same time, it's not as easy as just doing the research and making the application. A lot of times things are more complicated than they seem and technology might not be ready yet, even if some people are claiming it might be uh, a useful technology for the cognitive phenomena at hand. This happens in the context of reading. So for example, should you invest in speed reading technology? Will that help you read faster? If you read that review that we found earlier in this lecture, what you'll find is they don't recommend the speed reading technology. It mostly hasn't been proven to actually improve your reading speed along with your ability to comprehend what you're reading. In general, when you read faster, you sacrifice comprehension. Let's take a look at one funny example where research from cognition has been applied into a technology that supposedly will help you read faster. We can look at the example in terms of sprintreader.com. This uses a technique that was developed in cognition called RSVP or Rapid Serial Visual Presentation. And it's a way to present words very quickly and allow you to read them while they're being presented to you. I'm just gonna highlight this and pop it over here. And let's check it out really quick. There's the Sprint Reader website. If we scroll down, we can see a demo. I'm gonna make this a little bit bigger and I'm gonna press play. You're supposed to look at the red letter and watch the words. They're gonna come one at a time very quickly. See if you can read the sentence. All right, you can try it out with different speeds. Let's bump it up to a thousand words per minute and see how that looks. 
do it again. I'm not sure how well this is going to translate into the video. The idea here is that you could flash words really quickly at people and they would still be able to read those words as sort of a miracle. So will this technology change how people view text? Probably not. Some research that's been conducted on this technique suggests that it's not a cure-all for improving reading speed, uh, but it, it, it does seem to work a little bit. You, you can use this technique and you can sort of read what's going on. So there's a technology here potentially that could be developed further. There's lots of other ways, I'm sure, that uh, te technology from cognition could be used to improve things like reading speeds, reading comprehension, and others. All right, a final theme is implications of cognition for society in general. We're gonna be talking about this in different modules throughout the course. Cognition is really connected to many topics in our daily life. And it, it has the potential to help us understand ourselves, our society, and other cognitive creatures like animals and maybe even machines. We can see how applied cognitive research could help repair cognitive impairments. It could improve everyday cognition and it could lead to useful smart technologies. At the same time, cognitive research has been around for quite a while and it has already had implications for society over the last 150 years. If we look at that history, we will see inequalities in the social benefits and costs of these research applications. And so we will discuss this history and consider it across the semester. Here's some questions to keep in mind as we engage with the field. What are the general goals of the cognitive sciences and research in cognitive psychology? Who has been involved in setting those goals? Are the goals useful? What kinds of questions about cognition have already been asked? What were the scientific as well as social historical reasons for why those researchers asked those questions? What answers were found and how were they informative or not informative about how cognition works? How do the measurements and tools that researchers use to ask questions influence the kind of picture they build about how cognition works. What kinds of questions about cognition are not being asked that should be asked? Why are they not being asked? What benefits to society have been produced by the cognitive scientists? Sorry. Have the benefits been spread equitably across different groups of people? What costs to society have been produced by the cognitive sciences? What how are the costs shared by society? Are there injustices? Have they been adequately addressed? How should society decide whether or not to proceed with different kinds of research? Okay, there's many more questions we can keep in mind as well. So what's next? This is the end of the first mini lecture for module one. You can continue by reviewing the Calmry section in chapter one, and then watching the associated mini lecture for that. Once you're done, Go ahead and complete the quiz writing assignment for this first module and do that before the uh, due date posted on Blackboard. Thanks again, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>